right? It's man, this is before CG. This was like this was in a world before Jurassic Park happened. Like it's oh. just it's crazy how man, like what? So like 40, 42, 43 years later, people are still watching it. Like I myself, like if I when it comes to the original prequels, like sequel, the original movies, I will always watch the theatricals. It's just like these just grown men playing with models. Oh, you, you made you made a space war. Like what? Like it's insane how they were able to pull that off. Oh, I'm so glad. I still have the the VHS versions of this on original, and I saw and you when you uh, made me go buy your movies to get seeing the new hope for the first time ever on an original like copy i'm just my gosh it's so so good and i was so, so impressed good. i was so surprised at me as like like a, i'm 21 years old not seeing these movies for like maybe like 10 years or something and seeing them again and sitting down and still being like excited to watch them it's such a amazing experience it's such a weird experience and it's like you know not everybody not every movie franchise is going to be able to do that no it's uh how they're able to capture something so special is just crazy in every single way george lucas just surrounded himself with the right people at the right time and just made something perfect like it's man like you make, you look at the work of john williams and the score it's just the music carries this movie the entire time. And that all just became, it all came from John Williams' mind. And it's just, you, you wouldn't have Star Wars without that, but you wouldn't have, have Star Wars without Harrison Ford, who wasn't, Ben, he wasn't even going to be in the movie. He was just there to read the lines of Han Solo for people trying out for Luke Skywalker. He was there because he did American Graffiti with George. He wasn't going to be in the movie. He used to the movie because George surrounded himself with the right people and yeah. the world's luckiest dice roll. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, uh, yeah, it's like the score is so amazing. And I, I will just grammarly c clarify in one thing when you say carries, because I think when carry, I think of like, it's lugging around the rest of the film, <laughs> but I do agree with what you said. It's like every single element, it's like every single choice, everything in this movie complements the other thing to the point where if there's a small little blip of like, you know, maybe an Amp Roo line read or a, you know, a Carrie Fisher accent <laughs> or every accent moment slip. like that, there's like, there's like 20 other things that are going for those moments because what, what's before that uh, Carrie Fisher accent or after it, her home planet gets blown up Great. in one of the best Mr. And one of the best deceiving moves that Peter Cushing does. It's like, she's lying and even though she's lying, he doesn't know she's lying. He blows it up anyway. And then when it's later, he's surprised. He's like, she lied to us. I'm like, no yeah. kidding. <laughs> yeah, of course she did. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's like one of those moments where you can constantly still, like, even though there's so, like, faults, not, not, not so many. There's just a few faults in this. It still brings it up. Like, this movie was nominated for Best Picture when it came out. And while I don't necessarily think, uh, I would, I don't, I don't know. It's it, to me, it's not like a perfect movie with that. And I'm not going to get into the conversation about perfect movies, mm -hmm. but it's definitely one of those films. I, I, on a technical standpoint, in terms of crafting assembly and everything like that, I completely understand. And unlike a film like uh, Avatar, where it's like, you know, the idea of a world building and spectacle and something like that. I'm just so tired of it. And it's just so it's like paper thin in terms of the, the richness of it. Mm -hmm. This is a movie where I'm just like, it's so simple, but I, I want to see it all the time. Um, even to the point where R2 at the very end of the metal of uh, the metals, like the medallion giving out. And he's like, <laughs> just there after being dancing. blown up. <laughs> I'm like, no. Uh, oh. no, man, when he gets shot, like when they're doing the trench run, and Luke gets hit, and they shoot R2 every time. They did it again! <laughs> ah! but, uh, but man, when he walks out, he's all shiny, like at the medallion scene. Oh, man. So oh. good. It's so good. It's uh, it's one of those moments. I can't break down everything about that trench run, because it just gets me so excited. It's so it's so perfect. It's, well, it's uh, crazy, because like you even look at um, all, these, like, all these actors that were these pilots. Such small roles. Like we're talking minutes of screen time, not even 
But to this day, the ones that are alive are still out doing conventions, still receiving fan mail. How many years later? And it's because, well, he was Red Leader. Mm-hmm. I guess it's, it's crazy how just the smallest little thing, and it's still so influential on today. Yeah. And I got to thank you too, because like with uh, this movie really made me appreciate everything when it comes to films in terms of like the extras, especially mm-hmm. like I pay attention to extras and like, I think a lot of the performances from the extras are pretty much fine in this movie. Like there's none that makes me like upset. Like there's a couple, again, auto uh, audio dubs from like the look, sir, droids, like those moments. I'm just kind of like, eh. yeah. there's not much in terms of the extras that makes me uh, upset. Like I think everybody's like doing a fine job. And I got to thank you because you showed, you gave me the DVD, if nobody's heard of it, um, L Street 1976, which I think is a must-see documentary. Oh, it's, uh, it's, if anybody who calls themselves a Star Wars fan, it's, uh, it's a really cool insight yeah. on just all the, the background actors and just what it means to be a Star Wars background actor. Yeah, it's like their, their lives. It's their. Uh, it, it's what they were doing now. What they were dealing with, like the problems that Star Wars brought up, the good things Star Wars brought up. It's, it's great, and it's, um, yeah, it's it, yeah, like you said, it's great insight. I love that. Um, I think the last thing I, def- I definitely want to talk about with this film, uh, because I'm just thinking back to it. Not the last thing, but coming close to it, I just re- started realizing what I really was struggling to talk about with Luke in the beginning. Because I had to get to the end of this to understand it. Yeah. Um, while all the characters in this movie, uh, there's that every single thing in this movie has an arc, has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a growth throughout it. The rebels uh, start off at their lowest point, and their, ch- their story is simple. They got the plans from the Death Star, and they're just trying to defeat the Death Star. But we only focus on the Rebels t- like three times in this movie. When th- the opening, when uh, we get to introducing the plans, like when they get the plans, and then the trench run itself. But again, we're not focusing on the Rebels. The people that we focus on are the people who change the, who mm-hmm. change the, the course of everything. It's the individuals who help this rebellion out. It's Luke Skywalker, the young boy who started off just wanting to, you know, go to an academy to be a pilot, to being an X-Wing pilot that destroys the Death Star, not through the powers of, of the computer, but through the Force, this thing that is just, uh, he didn't even know about, like, in the right. same day. We don't even know if he got trained on an X-Wing. He just magically can fly one for some reason. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. It's like, and again, going one of the last things I'll talk about is special editions, but and they mentioned that, but it's again, it's not really consequential. It doesn't matter at this point. I'm like, I, mm-hmm. I don't need to like. We've heard he's a pilot, but it's one of these points where I don't care because I love this character. He's put up so much, so the idea of him being at that center, like piloting, fine, it makes sense. I it makes sense. He can yep. he can do he so many other pilot. things. Yep, it works. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need to go in. I don't need somebody to like, rag on me. You know, Luke doesn't know. He didn't go to high x <laughs> I'm like, just shut up. Because everything that has been set up with his character has led to this point. Did you, you blow are up not- the Death Star? <laughs> <laughs> but then you see like Han, again, like we said, go from that man who's just like screwing some people out of money to being the guy who comes in as the hero at the end of the day. Without him, Luke would be blown to smithereens across the Death Star miniature trench. Uh, uh, While Leia herself does not have a major arc in this film, she has been able to be a part and like, you know, she's set up to this idea of trusting in these individuals as opposed to just the straight rebellion, which is great. Uh, and it's like even R two D two, like he was a man who, well, he was a he was a little tin can who thought he was untouchable. And by the end of this movie, he gets blown up. So it's like, yeah, you know what, R two, <laughs> he deserved that. And the whole movie was uh, I was just hoping that he would get punished in some way, and he did. <laughs> yeah, man, he got beat up though. Like, yeah, even when three PO gets like beat up and like, well, he gets like his arm ripped yeah, off or something. Yeah, and like, he's, like, and, like getting... he's in the shadows, like. I think I'm melting. Yeah, the only thing that happened to him was he got shot by Jawas. Uh. <laughs> so, like, yeah, you know what? That little guy does, that little bastard needs to get shot. <laughs> it's the only way to learn. I'm sorry, R2. I love you so much. Um, 
but yeah, there's you no. Know, but the growths of every single character, even Darth Vader, comes up as the big evil villain who's able to just choke people. He's able to stand to this this really just this. He's almost narcissistic about while he's like the individual that stands out as like you know he believes in this religion of uh, of the Force. He still is somebody who stands as a narcissist and then doesn't see something coming. Like that right? is so oh, at the cool. end, yeah, where he gets he gets hit by his own like guy. He gets hit by a TIE fighter because he didn't see Han coming in and he's floating off into space. Just like knocks him down a little bit, you know? Just like almost humanizes him. Like he yeah. has the room for error. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, every, every single character has got such a great build in this film. Oh, yeah. It's, I, I, I and what's so cool is like Ben Kenobi, his growth is so thinky. It's like, I, you got to sit down, you got to really think about it. And I don't want to do that right now because <laughs> I've talked a lot about a lot of things right now. <laughs> the one thing I do want to get into though, for sure, is the special editions. So mm-hmm. as we touched on, we've both seen the original cuts of these films. We've both seen the, the, the special editions. Um, I just watched the special edition for the first time in a long time, a few days ago. And what I say about A New Hope, if anybody was to ask me, what do I feel about every single Star Wars film just on its own? A New Hope makes me excited for Star Wars again. Makes me super excited to just go back into this world. A New Hope special edition makes me very mistrustful that makes sense i do not trust because i was watching this movie and i'm like stopping it. it's like okay is that a special edition Adi- like is it a special edition addition it's like is that is that is that blaster fire added is that explosion like i didn't even know if the explosion of alderaan was the explosion mm-hmm. from the original film um i didn't know if uh what was it i was even like are the lightsabers changed I- yeah it's uh it's I don't know, like I, in what Star Wars people call our, our purists, where it's, you know, I'm a huge fan of the originals, a huge fan of theatricals, only watch the theatrical versions, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's, I understand what George is trying to do. Um, like, he even said himself, you know, that his, his ace in the hole is editing. Where it's like, man, Van Gogh didn't keep, keep on, like, adding stuff to his paintings. It's, I understand that, you know, he wanted to put in the things he wasn't able to put in originally 1977 but all of a sudden 19 what was it 1993 when Jurassic Park came out yeah when it really birthed like the special effects and man I just think it just opened up a whole new world for George and he just he really want he the scene with Jabba the Hutt for example in the special edition where it's yeah it was originally cut for the original but it was cut because it wasn't needed. All the information you're getting from that, we already got when we are introduced to Greedo. So it's not needed. So then all of a sudden, this thing is put back in and you meet Jabba the Hutt, who originally was a human, like a humanoid kind of figure. And so it's just like, you look at it and it's just, it's not needed. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't look right. Like it's the thing that I love. Well, one of the well, not the thing I love the most. One of the things I do enjoy the most about, especially the original trilogy, is just they made everything. It's like you look at all these aliens. They make these aliens. They make these creatures, and then there's this screensaver worm that shows up, and it's just yeah. I just I oh man, I, I understand why George did it, but it's oh it just it feels wrong to me. This feels dirty. It doesn't look like it fits. That's exactly what I was going to say. You're right in that it's like, it doesn't feel, it's not even that it's not like needed because it's like, it, it doesn't feel like it's part of the same world. What I love about Star Wars is not the fact, not just the fact, like, you know, a lot of people can say, you know, practical effects are better than CGI. There was a lot of times where CGI is one needed and two really freaking good. Like mm-hmm. I, I will defend the, 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 the evolution of like the new Planet of the Apes films with their CG or like even in 1917 recently there, there's like CGI effects you never even knew but you needed because practical was impossible. Um, the, what I love about Star Wars 
A New Hope and almost everything with the, the later films is that everything feels like it exists in the same world. It's like a lot of different galaxies, a lot of different places, but everything feels like it fits and it's like part of the one, the time period and two, just the world itself. Mm -hmm. I'm so mad about this right now <laughs> because <laughs> the can Moss Eisley is the only sequence that really has a lot of the special editions. Uh, yeah. And it's like yeah. in the original, okay. In the original, when they're getting to Moss Eisley, one of my notes was it, they kind of get to Moss Eisley pretty suddenly. Okay. So I get what George Lucas was doing. You want to make that trip feel like they were actually traveling through a place. Here's the thing. When you're doing that, you need to make sure that the CG that you're using and everything you're adding to it fits into the world that you crafted back in 1976, seven and eight, when you were doing that. And instead, the, the sand is a different color. There's like blue in it. And I'm just like, why is this here? Uh, it doesn't fit. The one thing that people really get on about with the special editions is the idea of the Greedo one. Han shot first, and then this one, Greedo shoots first. Um, here's the thing. Uh, my problem with that is not necessarily what happens. My problem is it screws up the editing that was going on in the original. In the editing, when Han shoots first, you don't see him shoot. It just, there's a big poof of smoke. Mm -hmm. But it's such a really quick edit that it's just like he's like a he's a quick draw and it's great. Yes, I bet you have. What this does is it holds for like three or five seconds longer. Yeah, oh God. Yes, I bet you have. Not really. Well, it's like even if you look, you're ruining you, you're ruining the, the, the little like pacing uh, of the movie. You're ruining oh, the I pacing of the film. Well, it's like you. Oh man, you talk about pacing when they first drive up and they're just like. You have like 20 minutes of just random activity just because, or like just when it's like random, just supposed to be humorous things where you have like a jaw on top of this creature, then it falls down, but it's going to hold its little like thing to stay on. It's just like, it's like why, why? There's, I just want to yeah. meet you. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to meet Chewie. Come I just want to see the guy who's like, he doesn't like you. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> that's all we want. And it's like when, okay. Here's the biggest moment. No, not the biggest, but this is the one, this is the first real noticeable change um, where, where they are just wandering with the lizard creatures. The stormtroopers are out in the desert wandering with the lizards. And it's the moment that we've been talking about this entire review where they're going, look, sir, droids. <laughs> cut it's done and <laughs> that's it so we're seeing lizards not for the sake of the scene but for the sake of seeing lizards because mm -hmm. that that was that moment in the film is just again in the original it's just like look sir droids and wipe away to the next moment it's like oh yeah they found them they're in trouble oh but now they have these worm horses like okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you're right too. And when they go to Moss Eisley, that thing that's falling, there's just so much stuff. It doesn't. And then when they're about to walk up to the stormtroopers, that giant creature just walks in the way, like, excuse me, I gotta go, gotta go down to my my watering my watering stable because I'm a Moss Eisley monster, and that's what I do all my days. I just walk in front of people. Oh, what's this? Some people are getting married. Well, I'm just gonna walk right in front of the ceremony because oh, that's what I way? do. Mind the way, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. they're, they're frustrating. No. Yeah, the worst one though is that Jabba scene because exactly what you said, it's like they talked about the exact same thing in the freaking. We already know everything you're talking about. They say the same line when he says, Even I get boarded sometimes. You think I had a choice? Even I get boarded sometimes. You think I had a choice? Even I get bored at sometimes. You think I had a choice? It's the same tone, the same line read, which makes me believe that that scene, when they shot it, like when they had the regular person, they shot that scene and they had the audio for it. And they don't, you don't see Harrison Ford's 
mouth when he's doing it. So they just took the sound and, you know, they put that moment there because it was a good, it's a good line. It's a mm-hmm. good line to set up the tension for this. Cause it's like, he's focusing on the gun, but then that makes me realize that either George didn't realize he did that back in 1978 or 77 when he was editing the film. And that makes me realize he spent too much time away from this movie to be allowed to put these special edition additions into this film. And what's even worse with that Jabba scene is when you see him, Jabba doesn't look like anything that he looks like in the other films. He doesn't no. look like he does in The Return of the Jedi. He doesn't look like he looks in Phantom Menace. It's a completely different it's, sounding and looking man, creature. The original Jabba the Hutt was one of the most like intricate like Muppet puppets they ever made. Like I, I not not mean the name job, but I'm actually like on a emailing terms with one of the guys who played Job of the Hut, and so we actually ages ago we discussed in great depth just about you know how it went down, what they did, like how just you know your Job of the Hut, how does that feel? And then he 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 didn't talk much about like the uh, the special effects or the special like uh, additions. But he's made the comment of just like, you know, you look at it and it's just the first time he saw it, he's like, yeah, it just it wasn't, that wasn't Jabba. It wasn't that Jabba. wasn't the character that we made. No. And it's like, it's, he doesn't look anything similar. And he's just, oh, it's fast. You know, what, you know what it is? And honestly, this is, you know what it is? Jabba sits around. You don't see Jabba move at all. No. Like, I assume that, like, in terms of when he gets to, like, his carrier thing away from his palace, I assumed that like, he was carried there. Mm-hmm. And so well, it's like, that's that's the one thing you're not getting about Jabba. Jabba doesn't move. Well, look at uh, when they, and we're getting ourse- ahead of ourselves by a couple movies, but in Return of the Jedi, when Luke falls down the Rancor pit, um, and then they literally grab the thing Jabba's on and pull him towards the pit yes. so he can see. <laughs> He doesn't like swap like over like, like I'm over here now. How are we going to do my body? Don't go by the Skywalker. It's uh, dry one. It's like because uh, it's the thing that oh, the part that in that scene that makes me the most frustrated is when Han walks behind him and steps on his tail, and it's like they had to do it because in the original shot they you know Han walks behind the the original Jabba. And so, like, well, we he went behind him, so what do we got? Oh, he's going to step on him. It's like, man, if he did that to real Jabba, like, it returned the Jedi Jabba, he'd freeze him again. Oh, you know, he killed he him. Just, he just takes it? Like, oh, come on. There's, like, there's <laughs> five bounty hunters around him, and he doesn't say anything. Like, it's just, it doesn't, it's, okay, there is no moment in Star Wars, the first Star Wars, that I say, this is one of the worst moments of Star Wars I've ever seen. There is nothing like that. There's not even, mm-hmm. like, even as much as I say, something's not great. There's nothing in it that is intrinsically awful. That is the one of the worst scenes I've ever seen in Star Wars. So unneeded. It is so unneeded. And it's, and, uh, it's so, and that's one of the problems with most of these additions. They are so unnecessary. And what's worse is they detract from the film in terms of pacing, and in terms of that one, in terms of character, understanding, set up for the rest of the films. Awful. Having said that, <laughs> there's one addition I do like. There's one... The, which one's that? Addition, uh, special edition addition I do like. And that is when Han runs down the corridor. <laughs> when he turns the corner and he goes, ah! In the original, it's just like five guys. Yeah. In the new film, it's an entire hangar of stormtroopers. Yeah, it's like a whole platoon of them. <laughs> I thought, yeah, when I saw the originals, I was like, oh, is this the actual moment? And then it wasn't. I was like, oh. That to me, that moment is ingrained <laughs> in my brain as like, what happens? So that. And like, and things like that, I can get behind. Like, it's you look at the theatrical compared to the special edition of like 
when they're in the rebel base, when they're in the hangar for all their X wings. You look at the theatrical, you got like three or four X wings in there. But you know, when you got the the, like the special edition, it's just rows upon rows, and they're like, you know, they're an actual army. And it's like small things like that I can get behind. Yeah, that one I didn't even notice, but yeah. yeah. Added on Jabba scenes. Come on, man. There's a reason it was dropped yeah. to begin with. <laughs> there was also um there was also the added scene uh where Luke talks to his friend uh Biggs. Yeah. Yep. That actor was cut from the film and not not from the film, but he was cut, his scenes were cut completely. Hey Luke! Biggs! I don't believe it. Hey, 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 hey. How are you? How are you? Hey. Coming up, I'll be right up there with you. And if I got stories to tell you, yeah. you sure you can handle this shit, sir? Luke is the best push pilot in the outer rim territories. You'll do all right. Thank you, sir. I'll try. I gotta get aboard. We'll hear all your stories when we get back. All right? All right. Hey, Biggs. I told you I'd make it someday. It'll be like old times, Luke. You'll never stop us. His scene with Luke in the hangar isn't needed again because that's not luke's story no that and it's uh luke has been developing relationships with other people like if luke is going to have a relationship like that it's going to be like an empire where he talks to his back gunner it's not mm-hmm. going to be or talking to wedge even in this movie where he's just like thanks wedge immediately immediate yeah like recognition for that character that character is now a person we care about it's, Wedge now. yeah no, i i understand like you know um like Biggs, he. You know, he has a great mustache, you know, great job. Like he's a of part course. of it and everything. But it's just like, it's the, the whole thing was cut at the start of the movie of how they know each other. And it's, it's even when they add on, like at the end of the special edition, when they add on, you know, you know, that's what we used to do back home. It's like, nobody cares. We never saw this again, mm-hmm. just unneeded. But it's, I don't know. I think it's because, like, Biggs, for some reason, was, like, always, like, a fan favorite. So I think that might be why they brought it in. But, like, I don't know. Yeah. And, look, I understand what people say, especially if, like, for the actor of Biggs. Because, again, watching Elstree, you see the actor. And they obviously put some time and effort into their job and not being in the film a lot, maybe just, like, an image in the next wing. I get that. I get the idea Mm -hmm. that you're you're put in a position where you put a lot of work to something and you're not recognized for it, at least on screen. I can get why that's, why that can be one disheartening and two, like just frustrating, but there's something, and this is what I, what I do believe is that there's always something that matters a little bit more. And that is understanding what, you know, the story is that you're trying to tell, because if this movie was about Luke and Biggs, it would just be, I don't think it would have been a, a well-supported storyline. Mm-hmm. I think it would have detracted from the idea of this young kid who gets enveloped in this idea of wonderment and everything. Like, yeah, it would have been more, almost a more like like Top Gun relationship with like Maverick and Goose. You yeah, know? Like, yeah. But, Red but, Five and Biggs. Right. But it's like Luke's story is a one of individual you know, he's an individual, he's the individual character. Oh, hundred percent. It's the whole, you look at the whole franchise, Luke's almost always on his own. Mm-hmm. It's uh and, Yeah. And like, it's, yeah. Uh, when one of my favorite moments in this, if, if, I, if we're going to pick two great moments of these movie, of this movie, uh, you could either go the opening where you see the ships or for the more uh, personal character moments, you could say when Luke is staring out at the moons. Mm-hmm that moment is exactly what Luke is like that. He's an individual. Who's he's a dreamer. For, he's a dreamer. He's an individual. He's a literal Skywalker who <laughs> wants to go and see what's out there in the world. And, but it's, and it's, it is his own personal journey because he's an individual who's like not been allowed to express himself. And that's what this, what this whole story does. Like he grows throughout the whole thing and his expression leads to the say the the saving of the rebellion which is it's just great it's it's exactly what's needed and you don't need to add another story that's not integral to it and that's what the mm. you know that's why film is an editing medium it's like you you got to cut things that are not needed and well as the, much the as it sucks it was rewarded right for its editing yeah just gonna shit on it later on a little bit <laughs> so. yeah 
it's weird. That, that's definitely one of the weirdest things. I don't think there's much else I need to need to touch on with this movie. I think that it's, like I said, it's the movie that got me excited to, to talk about Star Wars again. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about the rest of them, especially with you, Brian. Thank you so much, man. Oh, for, thanks, man. It's a good time. Yeah, especially for keeping me semi-focused with this. <laughs> for giving me, you know, I could go on a tangent for like five minutes and let my brain think. And then I remember, wait, there's a person. Oh, no. I need to, I need to, just, I need to wait a second. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I look forward to talking about the rest of the films with you. Yeah, it's going to uh, be a good time. For sure, yeah. Anything you want to, like, I've never asked this before. Anything you want to plug <laughs> to people? <laughs> Any plugs? Uh, if you're in the Edmonton area, go to bucha.ca. Check it oh, out. <laughs> yes, go to bucha.ca. Seriously. That's Brian's company. It's fantastic. It's like, oh. Uh, made me fall in love with kombucha seriously <laughs> get into it and also get into the rest of our star wars series uh, as it begins to to continue brian thanks again thanks once again and no worries everybody at home take care <laughs>